Thank you. Um, thanks very much for um, showing the film and allowing us to see it. Uh, what I'd like to know is, is two things really. I suppose, why was the film made? I mean, I know that sounds like there's a logical answer to it, but why this type of film and this structure of film? And also, as it's being made, who were the audience? Uh, who was it planned for as an audience? Thanks. May I know your name, please? Oh, yes. Um, Tracy Skelton, uh, and I'm from the Department of Geography. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tracy, for uh, asking this very really interesting question because I've been often not asked about this kind of question, so it's really uh, provokes me. This film was made with the tribals and for the tribals. So my audience were not you. It's eight years after you were seeing this film. I was not showing this into any film festival. I've never been into any film festival. My brother, who is a film scholar, he studied in Film School of India, which is one of the elite film school of India, Film Institute of India, those who know in India that how difficult it is to get into these elite institutions where only seven people get in out of a billion population. And he was studying and I was studying my computers and I was doing night schools and teaching my drivers. That boy who was singing there, we were going into uh, in summer uh, vacations, we used to have night schools and teach maths and other things. He has never been to any college. The one who said, your shared knowledge has drowned your sense of reasoning. <laughs> it's another kind of... We had 256 hours of footage and over six years we have been actually sharing this footage with the communities. We were showing this film. It was like a continuous documentary. That was my brother's idea. He saw similar things happening in libera liber liberation theology in, in South America. So he has seen those uh, Solanas and all those films. And uh, it was a collaboration. And I was also collaborating with an anthropologist, Felix Padil, with whom I have written a book. And I was collaborating with so many other uh, uh, you know, faculties, like geographer also I was collaborating with for creating maps and explaining them about the material flow analysis of aluminium and how similar things have happened in WIPA in Australia and other regions because I came to know about Janine Roberts who has written a beautiful book a beautiful book called From Massacres to Mining and that book is even not available now so we were translating those books and showing those books Bhagwan used to read those books and then he used to actually give us statements, which I used to take to other mountains. And uh, probably a couple of, uh, I would say, 100,000 people have seen this film. Overall, around 1.5 million have seen the film and uh, the booklet which we wrote called The Political Economy of Aluminium Industry, that was in Odia called Aluminium Silpur Orthaniti or Rajaniti. So that talked about everything and the film and the writing and uh, taking the oral history and meeting that Salomaji where I begin the film with. That was shot in 2001. And the last part of the film which you saw, Where Will We Go? That was just uh, before we started to edit. We said, Salu, we have already you know, accumulated so much of footage and we can't actually keep this in tapes. It's very difficult. We didn't have enough resources to do this. It, the film was non-funded. So I was raised by my family members and friends who contributed this film because we saw also those structures of NGOs and international agencies and how they create their own narrative. And this was a response for which we decided to make the film for them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very insightful um, documentary. 
Um, I'd like to ask, um, your film actually alluded to this um, at a few junctures, you know, where you showed and talked, um, um, where you showed actually about how cows were dying from drinking the water and how the fish had disappeared from the rivers and so on. And also, you know, you showed how this uh, mute man um, was describing how he felt, you know, like he was nauseous and so on. I was just wondering whether in your um, project, whether you had come across um, um, increased incidences of diseases, you know, caused by such environmental degradation. Um, the reason why I ask this is because um, I think your film mirrors um, remarkably um, the situation now seen for many years now in parts of China, where the same problem um, has actually uh, wiped out entire villages uh, in parts of China, and people have been dying actually from cancer. Um, I myself have spoken to, you know, um, um, uh, relatives left behind. So actually I'm very interested to see whether, to, to know whether you, you've actually come across um, um, diseases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eileen, for uh, asking another part of the question. It was eight years ago when there was not enough actually uh, people sick to be seen and now last month I was visiting the same places, one of the places I was just meeting Draupadi and almost all the villages in this are affected by the mining, almost all, in Prajagar, that one village where you will see uh, TV, like everyone has a TV and the village is called now uh, TV village like cancer villages, super jungle, and many other diseases like in Lanji Kurd. The guy who was saying that one feet of soil is yours and the rest is common, that's what he was told by the collector. He's died of TB. And he was a fantastic leader, Dai Singh Maji. This fan. These were the leaders who actually kept the movement alive. And he died of TB. And almost all the people around this Rengopali village, Bandaguda, Sakta, and many other villages, I can keep naming these villages, there are more than 100 villages. They're suffering. And they do want to hear about the cancer villages which you wrote, Ilim. They want to hear about what China is doing because Indian billionaires are talking about, look at how China is developing, look at where China is going and we're just, we're just lagging. So these kind of narratives are being also seen in this media, especially I'm talking about English media, we are completely uh, in alternative media. I myself was a journalist 20 years ago, 30 years ago, writing about it and I know how difficult it was. I was writing for Tehelka and Tehelka just blacked out us. And Dalka got money from Vedanta. Started to write that a new era at Langikar. And now it's creating this thing fest and bringing all these corporate big wigs and getting their money. So it's completely um, creating another narrative, which is about jobs, it's about employment, it's about all those uh, things which we actually do not examine their cost benefit analysis. But yeah, there are diseases all around these areas. And we are unable to document everything we see now. It's so vast. So we are only being able to only record the resistance because that is what we feel is alternative. Because people are resisting. Those people who are suffering like they are not resisting. Some of them are just dying for compensation so that they can actually take the, the medical help. So there is this kind of complex situation. Thank you for asking that question. Um, hi, um, <coughs> sorry. My name is Joey and I'm an undergraduate in the geography department. So um, I'm just really curious. 
I mean, I've really been impacted by what I've seen, and I was just wondering, amid so much hopelessness, in terms of, it seems to be like a losing battle that you and the tribes are fighting. So, what keeps you going, and what kind of hope do you offer these people? That's my first question, and my second one is, um, what can we do? I mean, as I don't want to just sit here to to watch and feel sad and and then I go home and life goes on. Yeah, so I just want to know. Oh, that's so beautiful question, Joy. I really uh, I feel that I'm really relating to such interactions with the university students when I was a university student, going to the universities and trying to find out some allies like you, who were really interested to open up their minds, talking about hope. I'm just here because we, have, we are celebrating resistance. We are celebrating the victory of the mountain, which you saw those people. This mountain is saved so far now. It's a historical referendum that took place after 10 years of our struggle in the Supreme Court. And we were lucky enough to have a good judge after 10 years of our battle, the other one of the Supreme Court Chief Justice of India was a shareholder of this company. So we lost the battle in 2008 and then we again put another application into the locutory application and we tried to we tried to convince the court that you have never hurt the people. How can you can actually pass a judgment about a mountain which is inhabited by people? People are not visible here. And we had a fantastic lawyer. Sanjay Parikh, who never asked us for any resources. We had a very beautiful judge who, on the day he retired, he passed the judgment because he knew the powers he's fighting again. And he passed a judgment, and the judgment was to just talk to the people get a referendum around this mountain, why their rights have been not heard, why their customer rights, their rights we say have under Forest Rights Act 2006 have not been heard. Very simple. And the referendum took place between two months from July around 16 to August 19. And in all the villages, you don't believe in every village, everybody wanted to say because the government has come to them for the first time. And what narratives you hear? It's all documented now. Every village, everyone, whatever they have said, it's documented. Fantastic. This mountain is saved. And it's with the Ministry of Environment and Forest, all these narratives. So you will hear in coming weeks, maybe tomorrow, who knows? Because now the government wants to take credit that they have saved the mountain. <laughs> and there is election nearby, so there is a another narrative which is going to replace all these narratives. All those NGOs who have been bought by this company are also bringing their own narrative. So it's a very complex mixture of where we feel that the resistance has given such beautiful uh, scope for us to share with you that there are only few people who actually stick to the ground for 20 years and that's because of that we are winning this battle. And you said, what can we do? Just by being here, thank you very much for coming to the screening because I am speaking from my heart to you. That if you put your 100% you will not be disappointed with life. Whatever you do in your life, just love what you do. And do what you love. You will definitely feel that's what is the microcosm of the planet where we are. You won't feel you are lonely in this planet. You won't feel all those values which are not been climatized, I mean monetized. There are many values which can't be quantified in terms of money. They are non climatized values. And we have to bring those values, the value of biodiversity, which can't be quantified in cost-benefit analysis or 
by the neoclassical economics. And that's where I feel hope. Thank you for inciting me to ask the this to you. Thank you. I have a question for you, and I wanted to follow up on that and ask you, this seems like a struggle in India. We don't have mines in Singapore. Does this relate to us? Professor Dutta has really incited another question which will lead to many answers. You know very well that Singapore is actually the center of all this commodity exchange. Singapore has started in April 2009, the first iron ore exchange. So you can see those iron ore mines and those pollutions have to do with Singapore. <laughs> so, and also to this company, Vedanta. You know, Vedanta was losing this case in the courtrooms. While they were losing this courtroom battles, it was the Singapore government which rescued this company by buying 30 million shares from the share market when London Stock Exchange was flooding with negative ratings. So we have to ask, what is the taxpayer doing here? Why the taxpayer is rescuing a company which is losing the battle? You'll be surprised that the French investment bank, Societe General, in March 22nd, three weeks before the judgment about, is about to come, they could feel in these courtroom debates that this, they are going to lose it. So they were projecting, they were giving negative ratings. The ratings were like, sell it. And when the company is giving an investment rating, agency is giving these ratings, you can imagine what happens in the stock market. The value of the Vedanta's share, because of the protests, it was going down. And what happened that government of Singapore and government of Belgium and the pension funds of California Teachers Association are buying these shares. And so also Aviva Insurance and many others. So this is what we call the butterfly effect of capitalism. <coughs> a sensitive dependence on initial conditions is trying to pounce upon the weaker states, pounce upon those vulnerable places where capitalism is trying to rescue itself. And this is exactly what has happened. All those tracker funds and pension funds are rescuing this company now. The finance minister of India was a shareholder of this company. And he was, his wife was a lawyer for this company. And he was on the board of this company. The day he became finance minister, he resigned. You have the Supreme Court of Justice, a finance minister, and a former Home Secretary on the board, US Ambassador, British Ambassador on his board. So you can see what kind of forces they were associated with. So no wonder why countries like Singapore, Belgium, and many other European countries are buying shares. Does that answer you? Hi, um, my name is Liberty, and I'm a PhD student from the Political Science Department. Um, I want to thank you for, for making this uh, documentary. And I guess I just want, uh, I have a couple of comments and a, a couple of questions. Um, I think the story is, is, is uh, actually, it looks like it's a specific local story, but it is a global story. It's, it's, it's very, I mean, I had the, the chance to work with um, uh, make the making of a documentary in the Philippines. And, and it's, it's the same story of indigenous peoples in the island of Mindoro having to fight Norwegian mining companies, Canadian mining companies. It's the same story. It's the same techniques that they do. And I'm wondering, do they have like an annual convention and they talk to each other? What do we do? You know, it's, it's, um, and, and it, it's, it's, I think you really did a good job of, of representing this kind of an existential dread almost in, 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 in the movie of this idea that the enemy is not something that can be seen or it, you can, it's, it's like it's, it's coming from everywhere, right? 
And in the name of the company's change, you know, the Saudi Development Fund, you have these, you know, and, and these people are just, uh, I think you communicate the, the, the difficulty of them having to, I guess, sort of process this feeling of dread, like, you know, how are we going to do it? And then you balance it with these, uh, these scenes of protests and, 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 and them organizing and acting uh, on, on this, this, this perceived threat. Um, I guess my question for you would be, I mean, in, in your travels, and, and you said so many people have seen this movie, have you met filmmakers like you who have made films that are similar? And my second question is, have you been, I mean, this is, um, you're fighting, I guess, people who have resources, and, and I'm sure you have had, I mean, have you had, like, death threats or something like that? So, death threats, I mean, have you, have you been threatened? Have people tried to buy you off? So, let's... Thank you, Elizabeth, for asking another interesting question. How to respond to you? I know a lot of Philippine activists who actually joined me in London protest. And uh, talking about filmmakers, actually one filmmaker from Space Hijackers. Her name is Leah Borromeo. She's a wonderful filmmaker. She makes wonderful films. Recently, she actually tried to send a drone into the Syrian embassy and filming it <laughs> and dropping uh, uh, pamphlets. And she's working with the mining uh, maf uh, 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 mafias who are trying to uh, invade the Philippines. So we have collaborations. I have another, actually, RJ. She is also Philippine, from Philippines. She is a cameraman. She takes photographs. And uh, talking about filmmakers in India, uh, in all, most of my interviewers, they have turned into activist filmmakers. So most of them uh, who were associated with making this film have become filmmakers. And some of them were attacked. Like, I was attacked in 2004, they broke my camera because I was bringing international activists to this mountain. I always bring activists from London and from Trinidad, from Guinea. We were globalizing in these areas, which is, well, it was not visible in India at that time. I'm talking about 12 years, 15 years ago. And now people are talking about globalizing resistance, but we were practicing that in real terms without actually making too much noise in the media. So as a result of that, this movement became strong. And what else to say? Uh, buying off and threats, they, are, uh, they can be only talked off record. <laughs> because I do not want to talk about those things in, when it is recorded. Because you never know where it goes and how it happens. But we can actually have a one-to-one -one if you are interested to join us and to do meaningful things like uh, these mountains. They say that these mountains are life. So I felt like my film is going to be a complement to their life and that struggle because this is also my everything for this. Maybe this is why I feel very happy today that I'm sharing this because it's a, also sharing a victory setting a victory of a 200 square kilometer mountain, imagine that, almost like this country, Singapore, I would say, more than that. It's saved, and all that biodiversity is now in, intact. So I feel that in dread and despair, give a little bit of turtle breath, like the turtle in the film, slow breath, and feel the slowness of life as well, because we are living in this uh, internet, social media, where we talk about how to be always respond to, to every moment. But there are also moments which to be lived for yourself. Uh, take 
take that V3 news, that there is one part of the planet which has been saved and the capitalist forces, like as we are talking about Supreme Court Chief Justice, Finance Minister and the Ambassadors couldn't get that mountain. And that's where I feel we can feel feel the joy of joy of some part of the planet which is alive and the people are feeling that there is hope. And that's where I feel very positive, talking about optimism. Endless. But that's the only way. Thank you. We have time for one last question. I am Susan from South Asian Studies, and um, I'm working on uh, foreign direct investment in India, comparing two states, subnational states in India, Odisha and Tamil Nadu. So um, this, your story is very familiar to me, and this narrative is very similar to other activists, right? But um, this, I can say this is just one part of the entire large uh, scale investment stories, right? Uh, state government has different story, right? And also, um, industrialist has their own you know, narrative. Um, I wonder. My first question is about your um, concept or your idea about social justice. You mentioned about it, right? So um, I guess your message is not towards uh, just this Adivasi saying um, Mangi, right? You are not. You are not making this film for. Uh, maybe protecting the livelihood of uh, Dumbia Kunt, right? So, um, what is your message? So, do you oppose to, uh, I mean, are you opposing to um, Vedanta or all multinational corporations in um, in the mining sector? Or do you oppose to um, entire large investment, I mean, a large scale investment project in India? And my second question is about. Um, my second question uh, comes from um, an uh, institutionalist perspective. So as far as I know, uh, Odisha government has set up RNI policy, right, in 2006. Um, do you know that? And uh, if that, um, what do you think? Is that kind of uh, institutional setting um, helping uh, people there in Orissa? Uh, you have provoked me like uh, anything. First of all, I want to tell you about your ignorance about protecting the livelihood of Dongria Khons. You are taking agency out of the mountain to talk about here about the Dongria Khons, that uh, we are actually not interested in protecting the livelihood and just say, uh, saving the mountain or kicking out FDIs. These narratives are actually the narratives of the existing structures that we are fighting about, the structures of violence that we are talking about. You are talking about resettlement and rehabilitation of 2006 bill, yes. That happened just after the killing of this massacre of those Adivasis. Because that was the state's response to the massacres. Because it was creating such bad reputation. And that was the reputational risk of the foreign direct investment for which the state has to respond. So they were not actually coming from a very benevolent, passionate welfare state. So let me make it very clear, there is a battle here, and there are a battle of narratives. And we know that those people who have got power, they will always create their own narratives. That's why in all these elite circles, when I come to the elite circles, I always also bring the voice from the ground. I always feel there is a, also a risk of associating with these elite circles where People who have not been even grounded in their own life about realities of life, daily to day struggles of the people, they often confuse me about who am I to talk about what FDIs are going to do for India. I know about few things, about land, about people, what <coughs> land means to people, what poetry means to them. Oh dear frogs and fishes of my river, will I be able to blink at each other anymore? I know what it means to them. I know what dislocation means to them. 
where 50 million, 15 million people have been displaced over so many years, ended up in slums. Nobody even noticed where they are. And we talk about all this GDP, talk about FDIs, we talk about things which 70% of India's population won't care. So who am I to actually talk about this? Talking about all this makes me wonder that what is that language that can preempt this kind of assault? There is a war against people. If you look at the biophysical reality of India, India's per capita available land is 2.1 hectare. It's 30% already exceeded. We need 2.7 hectares to just have a decent life. We need to have a different economics, which is not neoclassical. It should be ecological, because that's the only hope. And talking about figures and all those things that Vedanta has tried. Vedanta has tried to talk about creating values in India. Most of its annual reports were about creating values. And what kind of values that, that we are talking about? the values that can actually dominate the other values. Talking about FDIs, India has produced a report recently in the place in the parliament called Unlocking the Potential. And what nonsense, they are not been even <coughs> verified. They are not been even placed before the people. They are all for profit. So if you have worked with Orissa and Tamil Nadu, you must have seen all the narratives of POSCO and all those places. And all those little wine people and all those children who came into the street in the hot sun, sand bed, children lying in the hot sand in the middle of the sun, fighting for their land. And the government of India is talking about as if the children were instigated by their parents. There are bad parenting taking place in these movement areas. These are the narratives that you hear in the media. Because the, all the four pillars of democracy has been already bought. So there is only hope in the people's power. That's my answer to all your questions. for spending your evening with us. I'm sorry we don't have more time for questions, but I'm sure if you have any particular um, questions that you still have that um, Mr. Samarandra Das would be happy to talk with you about that. Um, we would like to present uh, Mr. Samarandra Das with a small token of our gratitude for his time with us at NUS with his workshop and the screening tonight. So um, please join me in um, thanking Mr. Samarandra Das for spending the evening with us tonight. Thank you.